Welcome to the Trinity Table Talk podcast, a resource for Trinity Anglican Church out of Littleton, Colorado. It will be the goal of this podcast to serve as a resource for theological education and spiritual reflection for all those who might listen. This season, we'll be taking a deeper look into the Sunday morning liturgy. My name is Andrew Winnegar, and I'm joined by Tim Suits, the rector of Trinity Anglican Church. So in last episode, we talked a bit about call and response as a major feature of liturgy, uh, especially if we're going to understand Anglican liturgy. We've got to understand call and response. Um, And now as we start stepping into the liturgy itself, maybe with a view to like the broad categories we need to understand before getting nitpicky, um, what is, what would you say is like the very first thing in the liturgy? What is the first liturgical action of the church? Yeah. So whenever we think about the first movement of the liturgy, uh, you know, people will say and think, you know, quite understandably, oh, well, it's the acclamation. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be his kingdom now and forever. And then I'll say, well, maybe, maybe there's something a little before that. And they'll say, well, is it? You're crossing yourself with the baptismal waters at the door. So, well, maybe there's something before that. The greeting, saying hi to people. Yeah, maybe there's (laughs) something before that. And we'll get all the way to setting an alarm and getting out of bed, right? (laughs) The call to worship does not only begin when you step foot in the church. The call to worship uh, begins with the weekly rhythm of you sitting down with your calendar saying, we're going to church tomorrow. We're going uh, to go to bed on time. We're going to get these kids in bed. Um, The ancient practice of church began on Saturday night that Mm -hmm. you prepared for church the night before. I actually knew someone in our church who he was a crucifer for many years until his health would no longer allow him to be. And he would talk with me about how every uh, Saturday night before he was a crucifer, he would meditate upon the cross before he went to bed. Mm. for a long time, like 30 minutes in preparation for his service to the church the next day. Uh, but the very first call or very first uh, call that beckons forth a response is the call to worship. You, you see this all over churches in, in urban areas to this day. Uh, it's a, an a, a Anglican practice, church bells. Mm. Church bells were the statement, it's time to gather. There is a call the bells are ringing, expecting a response for you to arrive at church to begin the worship of our Savior, mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. Maybe that should be a new deacon role at our church is somebody stands outside with a triangle. just like, hey, church is starting. Yeah. Get, get in the pews. Well, yeah, we really need that at Trinity because <laughs> half the time people are talking in the breezeway for, you know, <laughs> they arrive for the gospel reading if they're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I'm curious. So the first movement is is preparing yourself for worship and showing up, just yes. walking through the doors. Um, why is that? Why is that important? It's important, Andrew, because we are embodied creatures, right? Mm-hmm. We are creatures where proximity matters. We are creatures that grow and learn through our sense experience We see, we hear, we taste, we touch, right? And uh, the, the Anglican liturgy is all of those, right? We see the movements of the cross. We see the communion of saints. We see uh, Christ Jesus represented to us in the priest, right? Um, We hear the word of God proclaimed, both through the reading of the word, the singing of the word, the preaching of the word, and the visible word, the sacrament. Um, We touch, right? We pass the peace. Uh, Many traditions would greet one another with a holy kiss. I recognize that as a little bit beyond what we are capable of doing, except for maybe with your spouse or your children. Uh, But we are meant to touch one another, Mm. right? In appropriate ways. (laughs) Um, And then taste as well. That's, you know, something that's really important in Anglicanism. We have the Eucharist every Sunday. There is bread, there is wine, there is a meal. Uh, We engage all of our sense organs because in the garden, that's what God did with his people, 
God designed us as embodied creatures who are meant to experience him not as we escape our bodies, right? Many religions, what the what you try to do is escape your body by transcending the physical plane into a realm of enlightenment, right? That is not Christianity. Christianity says God has met you in the physical plane by being incarnate mm. in the person Jesus Christ. Mm. And therefore our worship should reflect that. Mm. So it's important to show up to church. Yes. Because <laughs> we are embodied creatures. True. Like we can't just, True. uh, I mean, there's a, probably a ton of different ways, especially after COVID that makes this difficult. Um, mm -hmm. well, I mean, really, this is an old, an ancient enemy of the church. This has always been a problem. This is not, this isn't something new because even what was it? John and first, second, and third John, mm -hmm. like he's, he's arguing against Gnosticism, which, uh, Will you explain what Gnosticism is? Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, I don't know how well I could do it. I could get like the spark notes. I think you'll do all right. <laughs> um, it's this ancient philosophy that more or less believed that all of creation was bad. Like the created physical material stuff. Yeah. It's bad. The world did not, was not created good, then fell. Creation itself is evil. Bad. And so... The spirit is good. Uh, so this was like in a complicated system of salvation with, you know, Jesus giving divine knowledge and knowledge being the thing that saves us. It's not actually our bodies that save us. So and so forth. Escaping your body is what saves you. In right. Mysticism. Yeah. But this isn't, you know, that, that was the early church. And, and then we've had some iterations specifically in, in our moment, because we have like enlightenment thought mm -hmm. that tended towards this way. Um, I'm sure this is not what Descartes meant to do, but his, his famous line, I think, therefore I am kind of sparked this intellectual dogma that personhood is found in the mind. Yes. It is, that is where it, that's absolutely where it is. So that's developed for a few hundred years. And then we get to COVID and mm -hmm. everything just gets worse from there. Mm. Um, because now we're interacting with the world through screens. Yeah. And we think, oh, this is a way, th this is an acceptable way of living. And it's like, no, if the faith has anything to say, if the church has anything to say, that is fundamentally not how you can interact with the world. Um, because we are embodied creatures. Yes. We have to interact, not just with our minds, but with our souls and our bodies, everything, mm -hmm. everything. Um, with that said, I'm, I'm curious to ask you, I can think of a few examples in my head, but how do we see in the liturgy, the faith played out in embodied ways yeah. throughout the liturgy? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the, the first thing that we see is that we see the faith of one another and that strengthens our faith. When we see one another actively engaged in practices of devotion, it helps us remember that we're not crazy, right? It helps us to remember that this is a communal faith and it, and it should strengthen our faith, right? Our, some of my earliest memories of uh, my life with God are, you know, listening to my dad sing terribly, right? He's such <laughs> a bad singer in church, but he was trying and he showed up and he was singing, right? Um, and I remember the devotion uh, connected with what might be even considered embarrassment for how bad he could sing, but it actually compounded the devotion. It didn't diminish it, mm. right? Because he wanted to sing to a savior. Uh, my, my mother, you know, holding me uh, through worship services, I remember wailing in the pews when my first pastor said, I'm moving on to go be a seminary professor, right? Because I loved him so much. Mm -hmm. um, I remembered grabbing at his, uh, he had a speaker pack on and there was a little dangly cord on it and he called it his rat tail. And uh, we would try to grab it and just the love that it was exuded. But you can't have that on a screen, right? You cannot have relationship where you have strength and faith through seeing the faith of others if you're not seeing the faith of others. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the very first uh, piece. Uh, the other aspects of embodied liturgy are that we see the movements of the cross, 
right? We actively sing and hear others singing. There is an actual pastor revealing the presence of Jesus Christ to you, right? Uh, And hopefully that relationship with the minister is not just on Sunday morning, right? It does not just stand at a distance, but you actually know that person enough to say this is a continuation of a previous conversation that we've already been having because I actually know who my pastor is, right? This podcast is only useful. Like we are not marketing this podcast to the Anglican church. Why? Because this is for our people because we know them and they know us. This is simply a way for us to be able to continue a conversation that has already been occurring. Yeah. Right? Um, the liturgy, the, the Eucharist itself, I think is the great example right, right. of embodiment, right. right? You're standing up, you're walking, you're shoulder to shoulder with people and you're eating and drinking. The passing of the peace is also one um, that I just love. And Trinity has a rather unique passing of the peace because it's just so long. And it's so long because it's probably a bad habit, but it's also because people actually like each other. And because we have so many children that we have to go pick up. (laughs) Um, And that would be another component, I would say, is that the children are resiliently embodied creatures right? You have a child very consistently running down the aisle and a poor mother chasing them down, right? Mm. Uh, This is not a a Gnostic ceremony where we are are all trying to transcend the physical realm, to get into our minds, to escape physical reality. The children just won't allow that, (laughs) right? So those are all the beautiful images. But I think the piece that really is unique, or it's just near and dear to the heart of Trinity, is that we believe that joy matters. Joy matters. Joy is what will fill your tank. Joy is what will lead you to devotion. Joy is what will lead you to change. Our lives will be characterized by joy eternally in the presence of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we define joy, our shorthand for it is, it's good to be me here with you. And I hope it's good to be you here with me. And isn't it good to be us here with Jesus? But notice that word, here, here, here. We know that joy bonds between people are built around physical time together. Um, You can have a really good friend that you can maintain relationship with over the phone, right? But you still are like, I need to see you physically like once a year. And we built the joy bond together and we can maintain a joy bond apart. But it's really hard to build that outside of ever having been in proximity to each other. So this is why we really believe it's so important to come to church. Right. This is not because, you know, we want more tithe dollars. Almost everybody gives online anyway. Right. So (laughs) there you go. Mark that one off. Okay. Uh, It's not because we need, you know, this, this huge room. Uh, We're already like scrambling to figure out, okay, how are we, when when are we going to outgrow this space? Right. (laughs) It's because you need it and your children need it and they deserve it. Mm. And they will not feel like it's good to be me here with you. And these are my people outside of being with God's people. Hmm. So this is why you'll hear me push hard for the importance of prioritizing embodied liturgical worship, because you need it. If you are a parent, your children needs it. And we need you. We need you. Hmm. The church loses a choir member when you're gone, right? The church loses a minister of the gospel when you are gone. We need you present. And that means that when you show up to church, like actually being present to those around you, Mm. Um, not just in the worship, being present to Christ, but being present to one another. Yeah, I love that. I'm glad I, I asked you that question because you went a very different direction than and then what I think of being a theater kid, like I think of like, Oh, the, you know, when the gospel reading is done, the cross comes to the middle. Mm. 
why to like in, in a very embodied way signal to everybody like Jesus is among us. Yeah. When we do the confession, we get on our knees whenever the name of the Trinity is said, some people will cross themselves as like a, a silent embodied prayer. And these things are all like, <clears throat> these things are all um, like theatrical. Yeah. And in that sense embodied. And so my mind goes there, but you're pointing out something I think really crucial that is easy to skip over <clears throat> is that embodiment inherently points us to our communal existence, yes. our social existence. Mm -hmm. um, that not only is my personhood found in all of my existence, not just my mind, not just my soul, but also my body, but so too is it found in my relationships yeah. of the people around me. So, yeah, we, we ought to say, like, no, church on Zoom is not a replacement for church. Yes. Um, th that can't be. That's a bad understanding of what it means to be mm -hmm. human. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think this, how do you think this transforms our understanding of mission? Yeah. Wow. Um, people might ask, why are we so passionate about church planting? Um, and this is why. Hmm. This is why, right? We can't just create multi-site campuses where we beam me in like Emperor Palpatine, right? And say, okay, here's your sermon. Uh, we don't believe that's how the Christian faith should work. The Christian faith is embodied relation and relational. And therefore, you should have a relationship with your pastor. You should have relationships with those in your church. And your church should be contextualized to the, to the needs of your community, right? I did not plan on planting a church with a kajillion kids. <laughs> but God told me to plant a church in Littleton. And as it turns out, if you care about children and you're in Littleton, Lots of families are going to say, I want to be at a place where people actually want to disciple my kids, right? But if you're in an urban environment or a college town or something like that, it might look different. Your embodied existence in your specific community should dictate how you engage the community and will change the makeup and the face of your church. And so instead of saying we want one giant, you know, megalomart church where everybody just gets ground through you know one you know cookie cutter filter we say no we want to raise up godly leaders and send them out to be embodied witnesses of christ jesus in specific communities mm -hmm. you know our church in, in 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 buena vista that we have the privilege of partnering with all saints you know they're a lot like trinity they feel a lot like trinity they have a ton of kids right and, you know, Kyle is telling me on a weekly basis, it's a really different environment. Mm. And I need to really learn and listen and engage differently here. Why? Because it's a different group of people. It's a different group of embodied creatures that Christ Jesus wants to minister to by his Holy Spirit. And therefore, we believe in the sending out of mm. churches. Mm. I love that. I, I don't... Um... I don't necessarily want to disparage other forms of evangelism, mm -hmm. especially because I think the Holy Spirit calls people to use different means, different methods. But I do think it, it shows, it gives language um, as to why when I saw street, preacher, street preachers in Chicago mm. or people handing out tracts in Tennessee, I was like, this doesn't feel complete. Mm. This feels off. And it's because it was divorced from the life of the church. Maybe they had follow-up systems. I don't know. But Let's hope. Yeah. Um, me as just a pure bystander was like, this feels off. Mm -hmm. And it's because of that. Yeah. Like church planting is the, the heart of missions. That's what Paul did all throughout the book of Acts. Yeah. Planted churches. Amen. Well, I think that's a good place to end this episode. Thank you, Tim, as always. Thank you, Andrew. It's good to be me here with you. <laughs>